Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. Curtindo um podcast, né? Sabe o que você também vai curtir? Saber que o melhor flip de todos os tempos chegou. O novo Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 6, com flex cam, que tem zoom automático e faz selfies de 50 megapixels. E com bateria estendida para nunca te deixar na mão. Vá a uma loja ou saiba mais em samsung.com.br. Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 6. Galaxy AI chegou. All right, everybody, welcome to part two of Babyface Nelson. Before we get going, I do have to thank a Venmo donation by Jeremy. I do appreciate that very much. Anybody else who wants to do a one-time donation, you can always go to Venmo. You can find me at MC Podcast or still pumping out three episodes a month on Patreon. If you want to join there, go to patreon.com slash mysterious circumstances. Check out the tiers, see if you're interested. I will not read reviews at the end of this episode. I will wait till the next one. I do have a couple, though, already. So if you want to get your review read, get it in. I do appreciate it. It helps me get found. With that being said, on with the show. This podcast contains adult content. Some of the themes or topics may include information on murder, kidnapping, torture, dismemberment, Maybe some demonic content with information on positions and paranormal activity. This podcast will also include explicit, horrible and foul, socially unacceptable, totally uninhibited, adult themes language. So if you're easily offended, if you're easily triggered, then I highly suggest you turn this off now and if not... Just keep in mind, parental discretion is advised. I do have to credit a couple sources before we get going. Two major books, Public Enemies, America's Greatest Crime Wave, and The Birth of the FBI, which is a book written by Brian Burrow. Highly suggest it. It's easy to find. It's on Amazon. You can buy it. Great, great book. Another one is called Babyface Nelson, Portrait of a Public Enemy, written by Stephen Nichol and William Helmer. I did reference this book in part one. Go check them out on Amazon and... uh All right, where we left off in part one, the young Gillis family had just moved to an apartment in Cicero, which is a section of Chicago, and they had a lot of extra money. Mrs. Gillis, she knew what was going on, but the families were kind of wondering how all this extra money was getting made, because technically George was just working. He was working a lot of hours, but he was working a regular job at the Standard Oil gas station still. So they're like, how are you guys affording this apartment? He had just bought a brand new car like a few days after uh, one of the one of the house robberies and shit like that. So they're like, what's going on? So he's telling his family... Helen's dad had given them a loan for the money, and Helen's telling her family that Lester's mom had helped with some of the bills that to where they could afford all this stuff. In all reality, Lester Gillis, who's every now and then going by the alias George Nelson, you know, he was doing those home invasions and shit, he's out doing some gangster shit. And I am going to refer to Lester Gillis as George Nelson or Babyface Nelson from now on, because this is when he is adopting the alias a lot more. The apartment was in that name and stuff like that. The car was in that name. On April 21st, 1930, Nelson robbed his first bank, making off with approximately $4,000, which today would be about $62,000. And for those of you who don't think that's a lot of money, back then the living wage was about $1,100 a year annually. So, they did pretty good on that one. 
On May 11th, 1930, he has a daughter born. She ends up being named Darlene Gillis, still keeping with the original last name. On May 16th, 1930, just five days after his daughter is born, the gang goes and robs a Chicago jeweler by the name of Walter Lynn Akers. This is another home-style invasion. Walter comes home. Four men with pistols are waiting for him inside. And they had found his wife and two-year-old son before they got there. And they had him out. And they had blankets over their heads. And they're holding him there. And as soon as Walter walks in, one guy says, quote, We have come for the keys to the store and the combination to the safe. And if we get them without trouble, no one will be harmed. End quote. So Walter gives up the info. Two guys go to the store, totally ransack the place. Two guys ended up staying behind at the house to watch the two hostages. They ended up going through the store, and they robbed it of $25,000 worth of jewelry, which today would be roughly $387,000. So the two guys who had gone to the store, they go back to the house. And they pick up the family, and they're like, no, nope, you guys are coming with us for a while. So they're heading back into Chicago. And Nelson looks in the back, and he sees that the kid, the young kid, is scared and kind of shivering. And he turns around, and he tells his parents, we won't hurt that kid for the world. I've got two of my own. And then the gang lets him out on Mannheim Road outside of Chicago, and they tell Akers, well, Lynn, we hate to impose on you this way, but this is as far as we can take you. And the family did end up making it home safely. And in the summer and early fall of 1930, the gang takes a little bit of a break from robberies. Nelson has a new hobby at this time. This friend that he grew up with by the name of Clarence Leader, who went by Clary, he had a friendship to... George Nelson, kind of like Perkins did. If you remember me mentioning his friend, his childhood friend Perkins in the first episode, well, it was kind of the the same situation. Like, Leader had moved into the patch, and he was a Jewish kid, and there weren't too many Jewish kids around. And even though Leader was a couple years older than Nelson, like, he, Leader was getting his ass bullied up and down, man, all the time. And it was the same thing as a lot of his friendships. Like, Leader went on to say that as soon as he became friends with, with George Nelson, you know, the young Lester Gillis, all the bullying stopped because the dude had street cred and like everybody knew about his temper, you know, he was a fighter, he's a feisty kid. But Leader actually went on to say, quote, he had an iron will. You either loved him or you hated him. And that was the way he wanted it. If he was on your side, you couldn't have a better friend in the world. I never believed half of the things the papers said about him, end quote. And that was talking about, like I said, his friendship with, with George Nelson. Well, Leader owned Oakley Auto Construction Company, and this is where they did a lot of stuff with cars. Well, Nelson, like I said, he adopted this new hobby, and he starts building a race car. And he actually competed in some races at Roby Speedway, and he always had a respectable finish, but he never took home any prizes. But even Leader said he was one of the best damn drivers he had ever seen. Like, that was just his thing. So in September, the gang gets back together and decides that there is too much risk involved in jewelry heists. Like, they can't keep doing this shit, and they decide to start going for, like, straight cash. Like, only go for cash. On October 3rd, 9 a.m., Nelson and his gang robbed the Itasca State Bank, which is about 15 minutes northwest outside of the city of uh, Chicago. Nelson and Powell walk in. Nelson stops just inside the door, and Powell walks up to the counter and says, I'd like to buy a cashier's check. So the teller bends over and reaches for the ledger, and by the time the cashier stands up, Powell puts a 45 in his face tells him, hey, this is a stick-up, step back. Nelson walks towards the tellers at this point, pulls out a pistol, and tells them to lay on the floor. Powell starts raiding the cash drawers. Nelson tells them to open up the vault, and they end up getting $4,600 in cash, which today would be about $71,000. A teller later identifies Nelson as one of the robbers. 
three nights later, on the evening of October 6th, Nelson and a couple other guys see a woman named Mary Walker Thompson walking down the sidewalk, and this is the wife of a guy named Big Bill Thompson, who is the mayor of Chicago, and they see her walking home from the theater, and she's just outside her apartment. Nelson walks up to her, puts a pistol in her chest, and says, stick him up. The second guy comes over and puts a pistol in her side. A third guy comes over, punches her bodyguard in the face, and puts a pistol in his stomach. Nelson shoves her into the lobby of her apartment building. He ends up taking a six-carat blue diamond ring, a bracelet lined with 40 diamonds, and a brooch set with 140 small stones. Now the price of these three pieces of jewelry that they got off this woman was worth about $18,000 at the time, which today would be worth about $260,000. Now she later had described her attacker saying he had a baby face, he was good looking, hardly more than a boy, had dark hair and was wearing a gray top coat and a brown felt hat with a turned down brim. And it's speculated, nobody really knows 100% sure. Some say he got the nickname Babyface while he was growing up in the patch. Others say that it was this article that was written about Mary Thompson's robbery to where he earned the nickname Babyface. And just for the record, absolutely hated that nickname. Did not like it at all. He He preferred being called Big George. Even though he wasn't a big guy, he did not like the nickname Babyface. About a month and a half later, on November 23rd, 1930, shit goes wild. Nelson and his crew hit this roadhouse in Summit, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. The gang busts through the front doors with pistols and shotguns drawn. The gang leader is described as, quote-unquote, an unmasked youth of about 18. So he comes in shoves the bartender and another guy into the back room, and he tells everybody to face the walls. Nelson shoves the owner of the place up against the wall, while all the other guys just start robbing everyone. Then Nelson yells at one of the gang members to turn up the lights so they could see everything better because it was a it was a club, you know. The gang member ends up hitting the wrong switch on the wall and and all the lights go out, like complete darkness. Right then, when the lights go out, the owner's great Dane comes out and starts attacking Nelson, and he uh, bit his leg pretty good from what I understand. So Nelson swings his pistol and fires at the dog. Now remember, this is complete darkness, right? So the rest of the gang hears this shot fired. They don't know what the hell's going on. So these clowns just start firing wildly all over in the dark, right? While this is going on... This dude named James Micus, who's a railroad detective, comes out of the bathroom, sees and hears what's going on, and starts shooting at the gang. It's absolute chaos. And this is in less than a minute. Three women are shot dead. Three more are wounded. One of the women that was shot dead was actually the woman who was singing in the club that night. Nelson yells, let's get out of here. And all the gang runs out the front door, and this dude, Micus, James Micus, who was the railroad detective, he's wounded, and he chases him out the door, and he gets in his car, and he starts going in, like, high-speed pursuit mode, and he ends up losing them in traffic. The craziest thing, too, is that at this point in time, they didn't realize that it was Nelson's gang and Nelson that had done this. They didn't know this until 1934 when one of the gang members, a guy named Stanton Randall, was being interviewed by the feds and he told him about this. That's when the feds were like, holy shit, we didn't even know who had done that. And that's how they figured that one out. On November 26th, just three days later, Nelson's gang robs a tavern on Waukegan Road and there's only three guys in the bar when they get in there. There's the owner, A guy named Frank Engel, who's one of the waiters, and one of Engel's friends, a guy named Edwin Thompson. Now, Edwin Thompson was a stockbroker from a pretty prominent family, and 
he had just stopped in there for a late dinner. He had been visiting his sick wife in the hospital. Man, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. When the guys get in there, Nelson, he told all of them, put your hands up. And Thompson, he just kind of nervously smiled. He was super nervous. He didn't know what to do, and he kind of smiled. And they said it was because he was nervous. Nelson looks at him and said, don't smile, you. And then he raised his shotgun and fired once into Thompson's chest, killing him instantly. And Nelson goes and stands over the body looking down on it and says, guess we ain't tough, huh? Then he turns to Engel, the waiter, and who's obviously in shock, like, what the hell, man? Nelson tells him to open up the safe, and he handed over $125, which is about $2,000 today, and the gang uh, goes out the door and leaves. And it's unfortunate. Like, this is the very first killing that Nelson is actually associated with, and it's over chump change to these guys, which is super sad, and it was probably a misunderstanding, you know, on on Thompson and Nelson's part, because Thompson was fucking scared shitless, but he just kind of nervously smiled. And somewhere in between here in the timeline, I could not find very much information, but there are two robberies, I believe, in January. I know one is in Chicago in January. I know there's another one in Wheaton, Illinois, and I'm not 100% sure when that one happens either. But it is of note that one of the gang members' girlfriends ends up getting arrested around this time. And when she gets arrested, she gives up the entire gang. And she says, these are what these dudes have been doing, blah, 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 just rats them all out. So in February of 1931, most of the gang members are rounded up and arrested. Nelson was arrested at his apartment in Cicero. This is the very first time that his name shows up in print as George Babyface Nelson. It was in the Chicago Tribune when they were, uh, you know, describing his arrest and what he was arrested for and everything. So he has a very, very quick trial, right? And he gets convicted of the robbery in Chicago, and he's sentenced to one year to life at the state prison in Joliet, Illinois. This is an infamous prison, all right, hardcore prison. Then in February of 1932, after doing a year of his sentence, Nelson was removed from the Illinois State Penitentiary at Juliet, Illinois, and he was going to stand trial on another bank robbery charge in Wheaton, Illinois, which is just west of Chicago. He was tried and convicted in the DuPage County Circuit Court of Illinois on another bank robbery charge, that which happened in Wheaton, Illinois, and he was sentenced to an additional 1 to 10 years. Nelson is running out of options. He's He doesn't know how much time he's doing. Either way, he was not going to do that time. On February 17, 1932... Nelson was on his way back to Chicago from his trial in Wheaton, and he's getting transported by train. Well, the train makes it to Chicago, and then they hit the southbound train, and that train going to Joliet was a little bit late. So because that train was late, the transport car that was going to take him to the actual prison wasn't there anymore. So instead of wait for another car, Nelson's guard, a guy named R.N. Martin, decides to just take him back to the prison in a yellow cab. You know, the old cabs, right? So they get in, and just as the cab approaches the prison on Collins Street, Nelson pulls out a pistol. And we really don't know where he got this pistol from. A lot of people say that his wife Helen had left it for him in the bathroom at the train station. Other people say that someone had slipped it to him on the train. We don't know. But he pulls out a pistol and he puts it to Martin's head. And he says, if you move, I'll kill you. Now unlock these cuffs. Then he puts the pistol against the cab driver's temple and says, you continue on to Chicago and do exactly as I tell you. Then they end up hitting the suburb of Chicago, which is called Summit. I had previously mentioned it. Uh, He tells the cab driver to pull over. He steals Martin's wallet and the car and drives off. He knows he can't stay in Chicago at this time. All right. Dude is a fugitive on the run. So through his contacts with the Tui gang, 
Nelson ends up going west to Reno, where he is harbored by a guy named William Graham. And he is a uh, crime boss and gambler. And him and his partner, a guy named James McKay, they controlled Reno. They ruled it outright. On March 1932, using the alias Jimmy Johnson, he steps off the train in Reno, Nevada. And he stayed there for several weeks with Graham helping him out, stuff like that. Graham ends up sending him to San Francisco. From the Bay Area right around there, Nelson goes to Sausalito, California. And he ends up working for a bootlegger named Joe Parente. Now, he worked as a guard on liquor shipments for about six months with two other guys, a guy named John Paul Chase, who ends up being a lifelong friend of George Nelson, and another guy named Joe Negri, who was known as Fatso. Like I said, both these two guys ended up being lifelong, trusted friends of Babyface Nelson until the end. All three of these guys worked as armed guards, like I said, when all those illegal trucks are transporting liquor, and they were doing, like, transporting illegal and stolen goods and shit like that. But they were also involved in more robberies and then some hijackings, too. You know, the dude ain't got nothing to lose at this point. And whenever Nelson would get somewhere, you know, he was on the run a lot, but no matter where he went... He would always send for his family. Once he would settle down in a nice quiet neighborhood, he would send for his family. And even when they were on the run, they were on the run as a family. He wanted them around. <laughs> he just, he, he truly did love his wife and kids. But as you, as you realized with the one murder that he already committed and moving forward at the same time, there's not too much sympathy for George Nelson. Not too much at all. The dude was crazy as shit. But anyway, his wife and kids end up joining him out in California. Now, in the fall of 1932, according to Joe Negri, he was looking through a detective magazine and saw George Nelson's picture in there. And he tells Nelson about it. And Nelson, like, gets freaked out. And he flees back to Reno and, you know, he's wanting some more cover from, from William Graham. And William Graham ends up hiring him as his driver. So while he's in Reno that winter of 1932, this is where he meets a guy vacationing out there by the name of Alvin Carpus. For those of you who do not know who Creepy Carpus is, he was one of the dudes in the Barker gang, like, the Barker gang was legit. And Carpus starts telling Nelson all these stories about the bank robbing sprees that the Barker gang went on in the upper Midwest over the course of the last year. And he says, hey, if you ever want to go back east out towards Chicago and Indiana and all that stuff, I can introduce you to the right people. I have the right connections for you. So Nelson's like, all right, I can do that. Well, later on, Carpus kind of changes his mind. He had heard about Nelson's temper from his friends in Reno. So he changed his mind and he didn't want him to join the Barker gang. So he says he'll introduce him to a guy named Eddie Bentz. And Eddie Bentz agreed to teach Nelson the ins and outs of bank robbery and furthermore introduce him to the right people for all these bank robberies to be successful, if that's what he wants to get into. So in the spring of 1933, Nelson heads back to Chicago, and he takes in a room at the Inland Hotel in East Chicago in May of that year, and that's where he meets up with Eddie Bentz for the very first time. And a little bit later that month, he sends for his family, that's when Nelson and his family moved to Long Beach, Indiana, which is just outside of Michigan City, right along the uh, right along the Great Lake there. And they ended up living there for for several months. While they're living there, you know, Eddie Bentz is his neighbor. There's a couple other guys who would be future members of the gang who are also living out there. And while while he's out there living in Long Beach, Indiana. Him and Bentz would go and walk the dunes and they'd be talking about, you know, planning and robbing banks and who they're going to put together for this gang and all this shit, right? 
So on June 8th, 1933, these guys have a bank target picked out. And Nelson drives to St. Paul, Minnesota to recruit some gang members. Now according to Bentz in an interview 20 years later, he goes and he recruits three guys to join the gang. One was late arriving. So Bentz suggests that he be replaced with two parolees that he knew. And he had met him and hung out with him in Indiana Harbor. And Nelson asks, who are they? Bentz replies, they're as bad as you fellows. No experience at all. Then Bentz kind of grins at Nelson and says, one is a guy named Homer Van Meter. He went to the stir for eight years for shooting a policeman in South Bend. The other one's name is John Dillinger. Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth, and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. So let me ask you guys something. While you're sitting around the house wanting to kill time, have you thought about trying Audible? Audiobooks are the best, and Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any new title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection. And you get access to daily news from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and you even get guided meditation programs. To kick off 2020, they are focusing on New Year and New You. They have plenty of content that can help you pursue any of your goals that you might be interested in, whether it's getting back in shape, finishing more books, becoming a better parent, leader, person, whatever the case may be. You can download any of these titles, okay, and you can listen offline anytime, anywhere. You don't even need a signal. The app is free to download and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. You can listen across devices without losing your spot at all. If you can't decide what to listen to, you don't have to worry. You can keep your credits for up to a year and use them to binge on a whole series if you want. Some of my recommendations, as you guys know, I'm a huge history buff, but I'm also a huge mafia buff. I'm into the mob pretty hardcore. I recently got a book called Five Families by Selwyn Rabb. For those of you who are familiar with uh, various documentaries or anything that that's that this guy has written, this book alone out of 1,600 ratings, four and a half stars. Dude, Selwyn Rab knows what's going on. Another huge one that I uh, recently got into was Gotti's Boys by Anthony DeStefano. For those of you who listened on my Patreon episode about Sammy the Bull Gravano, you know who this dude is. For those of you who listened to my Roy DeMeo episode, you know who this guy is. The freaking book is amazing. And of course, dude, one of my personal favorites and also one of my personal favorite movies is Donnie Brasco by uh, Joseph Pistone, and just so you know, the book has way more details. That's what makes audiobooks so great, and that's what makes Audible awesome, because they have so much. You can just type in a keyword, you know, you can search for any genre you want, and you have all of these selections come up. And the best part is, too, they also have podcasts. They have theatrical performances. They have A-list comedy. They have Audible Originals. 
They literally have so many books that if you listen to every single title that Audible had, it would take you over 300 years to listen to everything. That's if you played it at normal speed, everything at normal speed. That is freaking insane, and that tells you just how big their collection is. There's really not much to miss out on here. And it's great because you can listen while you're driving, cooking, exercising, gardening, relaxing at home, watching your kids at home while they're not in school right now. 27% of adults say they haven't read a single book in the past year, and that is up almost 10% from 2011. And the main reason is because they don't have time. That's what makes Audible so awesome because you just listen to the books. So check this out. If you go to audible.com slash mcpodcast, or you can even text mcpodcast to 500-500, you're in it to win it with Audible. In all honesty, in the month of April, there's a good chance we're going to have a lot of free time on our hands. So you might as well pick up an audiobook, learn something, read something, be entertained, enlighten yourselves a little bit. There's no excuse of not having enough time anymore because you can listen to Audible anytime. Visit audible.com slash mcpodcast or you can just text mcpodcast to 500-500 and go check it out. Nelson goes on to meet other bank robbers around this area around this time over the course of that summer like Charles Fisher, Earl Doyle, Tommy Carroll, those kinds of guys. And on August 18th, 1933, he committed a major bank robbery in Grand Haven, Michigan. And this would be his first in the area. There was not very much money in the robbery, but everybody involved made a full escape. You know, they made a clean getaway, so everybody was kind of pleased with it. But the Grand Haven bank robbery kind of convinced Nelson that he was ready to lead his own gang. I don't know why it did. They didn't end up getting any money, but it was successful and everybody got away. So I guess that's how that happened. On October 23rd, 1933, with five other guys, Nelson robbed the First National Bank of Brainerd, Minnesota of $32,000, which today would be about $632,000 in cash. Now, witnesses did report as Nelson was walking out of the bank, he had Tommy guns, and he's just spraying these things left and right at bystanders. No regard whatsoever for who he was shooting at, but he did make a clean getaway again. So after this huge robbery, he gets his wife, he gets his four-year-old son, and he gets his daughter, and him and his crew head for San Antonio, Texas. Now while they're there, Nelson and his gang bought a shitload of weapons from this underground gunsmith named Hyman Lehman. One of those weapons was a 45 Colt pistol that had been modified so it was fully automatic. This was eventually going to be the gun that Nelson used to murder Special Agent W. Carter Baum in Little Bohemia, which will be, you know, several months later down the road in 1934. On December 9th, 1933, a local woman tips off the San Antonio police regarding the presence of nearby, quote-unquote, high-powered northern gangsters. And I don't know why, but I just imagine this super old lady just seeing guys that are well-dressed in San Antonio and just be like, they have to be northern gangsters, I'm calling the cops. Well, two days later, Tommy Carroll... He was cornered by two detectives, and he ends up opening fire, and he kills Detective H.C. Perrin, and he wounds Detective Al Hartman. Now, all of the Nelson gang gets out of San Antonio. Nelson and his wife end up traveling west, back to the San Francisco Bay Area, where he recruits John Paul Chase and Fatso Negri for a new wave of bank robberies, which would occur in the spring of 1934. Now, during this time in late 1933, early 1934, a man was shot and killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Witnesses said the killers were driving a car with California license plates, and those plates were eventually traced back 
to a car that was owned by George Nelson. So after a short trip to Bremerton, Washington, Nelson and Chase proceeded to Reno, Nevada. Now Chase later said in an interview that Nelson had killed a man during an altercation while they were in Reno that time, and the victim was a material witness in a United States mail fraud case. On March 3rd, 1934, is when John Dillinger makes his famous wooden pistol escape from the jail in Crown Point, Indiana. Now, if you listen to my series on Dillinger, you know, some of these details are in dispute. But they do believe that a lot of the people involved in this, it was everything was arranged and financed by members of Nelson's newly formed gang, including Homer Van Meter, Tommy Carroll, Eddie Green, and a dude named John Hamilton. And it was pretty much with the understanding that Dillinger would repay them some part of the bribe money out of the share of his first robbery, which we do know Dillinger was very active after he got out of Crown Point. He didn't stop. Now, the night that Dillinger did arrive in the Twin Cities, Nelson and his friend, John Paul Chase, they were cut off by another car driven by a local paint salesman by the name of Theodore Kidder. Nelson lost his temper because of this, and he chased this dude down, and he kind of crowded him to the curb, this uh, Theodore Kidder. The salesman, who was Kidder, he gets out of his car to try to, like, confront him. Nelson gets out and shoots him dead. Two days after this, the new gang strikes the Security National Bank in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The six men were soon identified as the second Dillinger gang due to Dillinger's extreme notoriety, but the gang had no official leader. So in this robbery, which netted around $49,000, which would be around $760,000 today, you know, the figures kind of differ a little bit. Nelson severely wounded motorcycle policeman Hale Keith with a burst of submachine gun fire as the officer was arriving at the scene. And on March 13th, 1934, a week after the robbery in Sioux Falls, the gang robbed the First National Bank of Mason City, Iowa. And according to an article in the Des Moines Tribune on March 14th, 1934, this is how it goes down. The gangsters parked their automobile, which was a dark blue Buick sedan, on State Street near the alley behind the bank. At least two of them remained by the car. According to most sources, Tommy Carroll stationed himself in the doorway of what was then a drugstore. Babyface Nelson was across the street on or near the sidewalk by the alley. The other gang members either went into the bank or stood guard outside. The most probable versions placed Dillinger in front and perhaps one or two others in the bank. Tom Walters, the bank guard, said in one story that he saw five gangsters inside. The gangsters entered the bank shouting orders and shooting their guns into the ceilings and walls. Walters was in his elevated, bulletproof observation booth built into the wall near the front entrance. He followed procedure and fired a tear gas cartridge, which hit one of the robbers in the back. Statements differ as to which one was hit. The tear gas gun jammed and Walters was out of the fight. One of the gang members sprayed the bulletproof glass with gunfire, shattering it but missing Walters. While one or two of the gang cleaned out the teller's cash drawers, another, probably John Hamilton, took bank cashier Harry Fisher to the vault. Tom Barclay, a bank employee, saw what was going on, retrieved a tear gas bomb from the other office and threw it on the floor. Meanwhile, Hamilton and Fisher were all at the vault. There, the gang member made the mistake of allowing a steel gate to close between him and Fisher. Fisher proceeded to hand small denomination bills out through the bars to Hamilton. Margaret Johnson was a switchboard operator in the bank. Her office was situated on a balcony above the vault. When the robbery started, she crawled across the floor and shouted out of a south window the news of the robbery. The person standing outside that south window was Babyface Nelson, 
who, when he heard this, pulled out his submachine gun, looks at her, and says, quote, You're telling me, lady? The people on the street, as well as customers in the nearby Nichols and Green Shoe store, were used by the gangsters to shield them from police. Officer James Buchanan realized a robbery was going on, armed himself with a shotgun, and took cover. The gangsters in front of the bank shot at him but missed. Buchanan was unable to return fire with the shotgun he was carrying because of the human shield around the robbers. Police Chief Patton watched helplessly from the C.L. Pine Company across the street in the Frank Lloyd Wright building. Only one person was wounded deliberately by the gangsters. R.L. James was walking up to the corner of State and Federal, intending to go into the bank when he heard the gunfire. Realizing what was happening, he, according to his own account, turned around and headed back down State Street. He said that he ducked beneath the windows, hoping he would not be noticed. Babyface Nelson, according to the newspaper, ordered him to stop. James did not hear the order and Nelson fired a burst from his machine gun. The bullets hit James in the leg and he fell to the sidewalk. A few moments later, Dorothy Crum and her mother turned out of the alley behind the bank onto State Street. They pulled her car up behind the parked gangster's vehicle and stopped. Babyface Nelson orders them to get out of their car and into the gangster's car. Dorothy Crum argued with the gunmen and eventually he let them stay in their own car and they watched as hostages climbed aboard the getaway car. How many people were actually taken hostage by the criminals is not known. Estimates run as high as 20 to 26 people clinging to the sides of the holdup car. As soon as the car, loaded with gangsters and hostages, turned up Federal Avenue, a policeman, pulling R.L. James behind him, jumped into the back of Dorothy Crum's car and told her to hit the horn, stop for nothing, and drive as fast as you could for the nearest hospital. The hostages were let off the car individually and in groups during the next hour. The holdup car was found that night in a quarry near the community of Hanford, which is four miles south of Mason City, Iowa. So yeah, anyway, 99% of that information on that robbery was printed in that newspaper, which, you know, I told you where I found it and everything. Crazy, crazy shit. The fact that the one lady screams out the south window that the bank is being robbed, and I shit you not, the one person standing there is Babyface Nelson, and she says it to him. Like, that's just, (laughs) that's sad irony right there. But anyway, Dillinger and Hamilton were both shot and wounded in the robbery. Now, returning to St. Paul, Eddie Green provided a safe house for Dillinger and Van Meter, And on March 31st, federal agents raided that safe house. And we're going to be talking about that in part three, along with the wild year of 1934 for all of the gang, including Babyface Nelson. And we're going to be talking about his death as well. So, I hope you all enjoyed the episode. I will see you folks next time. This is your girl Yannick Taylor, aka Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that what you want, what you don't want, what sets up the. Now, this drink is brown because I learned something. 
since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement, their HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't mix, don't mix well. I don't know whether. And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts.